All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Kelly. I'm the program coordinator with the Rochester Hills Public Library. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, uh, The Dark Side of the Mitten, with author Thomas Carr. Uh, before we get started tonight, I'd like to take just a quick moment to remind you we do have another program coming up this Thursday on the 9th, and that is Telling Twain, sharing uh, some of the best stories from Mark Twain's life. That is going to be, again, this Thursday on the 9th. You can sign up for that at uh, calendar.rhpl.org. Uh, tonight's program will be recorded. It'll be available on our website and YouTube page in about a week's time from tonight. Uh, and then you can share that with any friends or family who weren't able to tonight attend tonight's program in person. Uh, other than that, uh, we would like to take a moment before we get started to please ask uh, audience members to please silence your phones or turn them off before we get started just to avoid any unnecessary disruptions during the program. And lastly, we'd of course like to thank the friends of the Rochester, the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library uh, with all of their fundraising efforts. They make wonderful programs like the one we're about to take part in tonight possible. And uh, we thank them very much for their support. With all of that being said, I would like to welcome to ten tonight's presenter, Thomas Carr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Joe. And I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, it is uh, cold out there. The downtown looks beautiful. Took some pictures. And, um, but I um, really appreciate everybody coming out. I have to say this is really a good crowd. I Maybe my best uh, post-COVID. Well, not we're not post-COVID, but I mean since COVID. In the COVID era, perhaps I should say. Um, and, um, so, uh, let's, I, I guess, uh, my name is Tom Carr. I'm a f journalist. Uh, I have worked, uh, as a journalist for about 30 years, freelancing for the free press for NPR, for Interlock and Public Radio. I worked for 20 years for Traverse City Record Equal, and I covered some murders both there and at, uh, for other media. One of the ones that um, I covered that is, well, the only one that I actually followed along from start to finish for many years covering it was one up in Kalkaska. And that one made, that one made the, um, that's the only one of the ones I've covered that made my books. And that made my first book in a chapter titled A Convenient Confession. It's a woman who was assaulted in her home. She was 68 years old, and she was uh, sexually assaulted. She was put in the trunk of her own car in her garage. The garage door was shut, and the car was started, and that's how she actually died. It was really horrible. Uh, there was a young man who made a confession, a very troubled young man. Then he recanted. The prosecutor said, well, we'll find out when your DNA comes back. The DNA came back, and it wasn't his. But... They didn't want to change their theory. So, well, they, they, they changed their theory slightly to me to say that he was an accomplice and, or that he had an accomplice and the accomplice left his DNA there, but he didn't. Well, a lot of crime experts say that murder, unless you shoot somebody or something like that from a distance, your DNA is going to end up there. Murder is a very intimate act. He spent 17 years in prison as a murderer. Now, he would have spent most of that in there anyway because he was an 18-year-old kid with a 15-year-old girlfriend. He was having sex with her, so he was charged with that as well. He would have served several years for that. He was no angel. But he was not the killer. They did not want to put it out the DNA onto the nationwide database to get a hit on the real killer. Uh, because that would ruin their case and because they'd gotten a conviction from a jury in spite of the DNA evidence. 17 years later, the Innocence Project with lawyers and law students from University of Michigan and the University of Chicago looked into the case, asked a, a judge to demand that they put the DNA on the database. They did and they found a match in no time at all. As a man from Bay City who had been interviewed uh, for the murder early on, he was given a lie detector test and passed it. 
he was let go. He was never looked at again until the DNA came back as his. So DNA is a really valuable tool, uh, something that, um, uh, you know, in modern cases is really kind of a, a, a one of the huge advances in, in criminal uh, justice. But before I get going on the um, bulk of my program, I just wanted to say a word about Oxford. Uh, such a huge tragedy, and I know it's very close to here, and I was almost reluctant to, to mention it, but I thought I really need to um, because, uh, you know, it is uh, um, such a horrible thing and happens way too often. I do think that it's really, really unfortunate that there's so many of these school shootings that a lot of them don't go down in history and end up in books like the ones I write because there's just too many of them. Just the, the, the most serious ones uh, are given a lot of attention. This one, however, I think will be very historically significant, largely because of the charges against the parents. However, that turns out that's going to be you know, a monumental case in Michigan and possibly in the, the whole country. Um, that said, school massacres, of course, are nothing new. Um, this gentleman, not gentleman, this guy in the picture there with his wife, his name is Andrew Kehoe. Anybody know who that is? Okay. Oh. Bath. Yep, the Bath School Massacre. He was actually a school board member. He was opposed to a new school that they wanted to build, and he took it, you know, very seriously, his opposition to it. He was very bitter about it, and people knew that. But people thought that maybe he had changed his mind and maybe he'd uh, turn the other cheek and was going to help out the school because he was toiling away in the basement of this school for a few weeks in the spring of 1927. They thought with his vast knowledge, he was a very intelligent guy. He knew about electricity. He knew about explosive and stuff like that. He'd helped, you know, farmers blow stumps out of their property and stuff like that. So they thought, well, he's going to bring us into the 20th century with uh, putting electricity in our school. What he was really doing was hooking up pyrotol, an explosive, and TNT, wiring it to the school clock in the basement of the school so that at 8.45 a.m., on May 18th, 1927, an explosion. I got to point it at the, oh wait, no, I got to learn the right button. That's what I got to do. <laughs> uh, an explosion that was heard 10 miles away in Lansing and in other surrounding communities. People rushed to the site. Half of the school blew up. Many children, some of the teachers were killed, 45 people in all. Now, that's the final tally. That includes the killer himself. That includes his wife, whom he killed at, her ho at their house before he came back to the school after the explosion, drove up in a car or a vehicle that was loaded with explosives and shrapnel. He went up to the superintendent and was talking to him, and as he was talking to him, he shot into the, the uh, vehicle. The vehicle exploded and spread that shrapnel all around, killing himself, the superintendent, and a, a young boy who had survived the first blast. This still stands as the most deadly school massacre in the history of the United States, and let's hope that it's never surpassed. But it was very different because there were no copycats. This was not a trend. This was a one-off. This guy, there were no, you know, you didn't hear about other people going around and blowing up schools. So there's something else going on these days, and maybe it's social, maybe, maybe it's a number of different things, but the copycat nature of what we see now is very different from this. But 
still in this little town of <clears throat> Michigan that nobody would ever hear of unless they lived in the area, uh, were it not for this uh, crime. Um, that is the deadliest school massacre ever in the United States. Now, seems like there was another point of... Ah, oh, well. Anyway. Um, you may recognize this guy, too. Sometimes I, I try to, you know, when I, when I put together, since I do a lot of compilations of different crimes in my books, and I think, uh, you know, who is the most famous, infamous serial killer in Michigan history, and it's probably this guy right here. He is John Norman Collins, and he was killing women in the Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area back in the, around 69, 68, 69. And he was caught, thank goodness, after he had killed what they first thought was eight young women, seven in Michigan and one in California. Speaking of DNA, though, 35 years after this, he was still a horrible guy, but they took one of the deaths out of his column because in about 2001, thereabouts, when the case was like what uh, was about 30 years old, um, he, the, somebody looked at the evidence of these different murders and noticed that one young woman, Jane Mixer, because she was murdered and bo her body left in the area near where his, he was leaving the bodies of his victims, they put him, her down as one of his victims. But somebody said, well, he didn't shoot anybody else. He strangled and stabbed them and he sexually assaulted them. None of that happened here. So they took DNA, very old DNA, from the uh, evidence locker and they had that put out there and in no time they had a hit on it and another man was charged with the murder of Jane Mixer and he is now in prison. But he is not the most prolific serial killer in the state of Michigan. That would belong to a woman by the name of Mary McKnight. Mary McKnight was a poisoning people in the turn of the 20th century for about 15, 18 years. Her official victim toll is 12 people, but some think it might have been as high as 18. Mary McKnight would poison her victims with strychnine. At the time, the most common drug for people who wanted to poison somebody was arsenic. Both of them were in many people's homes because they were mouse and rat killers that people could buy for about a nickel a bag and they were there and they were not, you know, restricted and, and people had them lying around. So you put a little bit of that in, uh, you put a little arsenic in somebody's food or drink and they would, um, or medicine, and they would uh, have flu-like symptoms. Back then when the flu was so often fatal, people would just think that a person died of flu. Historians even think that there were probably a few, maybe you know, not, not millions or anything, but, but there were probably several murders that were never detected as murders because of the fact that arsenic really didn't raise eyebrows at the time. However, um, she used strychnine, which was different, used for the same purposes, but that would tense up somebody's muscles so severely that they would be contorted forward or backward into such a position and such a tight, you know, position that they couldn't even breathe. It was a very painful death. And that's what Mary McKnight used. And she killed mostly relatives. And she was, at, and nobody knew it because she kept, they kept asking lovely, kind Mary to come and sit with people, with relatives who were sick. Now, maybe they, you know, I don't know why they didn't say, well, maybe she's not the best one to send because everybody she goes and sees is dying. But for, you know, well, over almost two decades, perhaps, 
she was doing this, starting off with two, with two husbands of hers from whom she got a pretty good you know, insurance payout. But the rest of them, she didn't have anything to gain from. So when her final victims, these, these are pictures that I took of the final victims' uh, headstones. There were actually three victims. It was Gertrude Murphy, John Murphy, which happened to be Mary's brother. So it was her brother, her sister-in-law, and their very young daughter, Ruth. Ruth is buried in her mother's arms and not listed on the headstone. But the Kalkaska County coroner and sheriff looked at this and said, why would this young family all die in such a short period of time of such heinous symptoms of something we haven't seen with other people? Because she moved around, you know. She, she was, it was all in Michigan, but it was in Alpena, Saginaw, Grayling, and Fife Lake, which was over towards um, Traverse City, near between Kalkaska and Tra in, in that general area. Uh, they said, why would they die? They, dug, they, they, they exhumed the bodies. They sent contents of the stomach to a lab in Ann Arbor, and they found that strychnine was in their stomachs. And so she was charged with murder. And she served 18 years at the Detroit House of Corrections with a prison that existed. It was a men's prison later on, but existed until just a few years ago between Northville and Plymouth. And uh, Northville is where I grew up, so I was well aware of De, De Hoco, as they used to call it. Um, but anyway, she, um, nobody knew why she was doing this, though. You know, what did she have to gain except for with her two husbands? So the actual reason, I guess, that has gone down into folklore is one that was a response of one of her sisters, apparently a very lucky sister, when they asked her, why did your sister do this? And she said, well, Mary just likes funerals. Can you imagine? She used to dress up in her nice, fine dre black dress, and she'd see all the relatives, and who knows what she was thinking. I mean, was she picking out her next victim or what? I mean, some people, some people to, to get the family together might try to, you know, try to arrange a wedding, but... Mary took a different, a different tack. Now, also one of the cases, one of the crimes, I know th there was a crime committed here, but we don't know if it was murder. But one that has always haunted me and has always astonished me and just fascinated me, and that occurred in 1913 in Calumet. And I'm sure many of you... Uh, Several of you are probably familiar with that. In 1913, in the summer of 1913, it was, uh, there was a strike at the copper mines. And it lasted for several months and turned very bitter. And there was violence. In fact, there were a couple of, uh, you know, some of the, um, there was a conflict in which some people, uh, working for the mine company shot into, excuse me, some boarding houses and, and killed a couple of men. So it was, there was blood there, but so it was a lot of bad feeling in the town. And this was a bustling town. I mean, it was, you know, 27,000 some. I mean, it's down to, you know, I don't know if several hundred or just a couple thousand now, uh, Kelly met, but it's a fascinating town because you go there and you can look that there used to be a lot busier town than it is now. Um, but, and a lot of people from all over Europe, you know, were coming there to work in the mines and such. On Christmas Eve, the miners, the ladies auxiliary of the copper, of the miners uh, union, decided to have a children's Christmas party. And they, it was in the top floor of the Italian hall. They... Somebody in the middle of all this yelled fire. Some people described him as a man wearing black with a big black beard and stuff. Kind of, they described him like, like they had, like, like the 
like the average villain on a silent movie of the time. But I'm not saying that they were wrong or anything. It's just kind of interesting. Yelp fire, people ran for the exits, and uh, the only exit was a steep stairway down to a door that, that opened inward. And when they got there, the first people got there, other people came behind them, and they couldn't open the door because they were being crushed against it. Now, the person who yelled fire might have just been wanting to create some mischief. They might have thought, well, maybe a few people get hurt. It'll be fun, you know, whatever, whatever their motives were. Did they think that anybody would die? I doubt if they thought that 73 people would die, mostly children. When they came, they, there were even, uh, you know, it's like a couple, there was a dead adult holding a child above their, above their head when they came through there. Some people had the foresight to draw, jump out the window, which was a pretty good thing because in December in the Upper Peninsula, there were some pretty big snow banks. And so they were, they, that was the safest way out. But most people took the actual regular exit and uh, the, the way they, you know, Christmas that year was marked by mass funerals. Calumet has never been the same. Nobody knows who did it. There have been accusations on, you know, that it was a uh, that it was somebody working for the mines. Some people think it was just somebody, you know, creating mischief. Nobody knows for sure. Woody Guthrie wrote a song about it, and they called the 1913 massacre. And in it, he says that you know it was the Union guys who did it, but there's never been any proof of that. There were also uh, pirates in Michigan. Now, with all the water around us, I guess it makes sense. But until, you know, a few years ago when I started looking into some of these, you know, historic crimes, I didn't realize that. Now, don't be picturing Jack Sparrow. No eye patches or peg legs or, or swords or anything like that. So this guy with you know, a little sailor's cap and looking like an early 20th century guy, but he was, he had quite a thing going there. He had a ship that he used for legitimate cargo, but he also moved a lot of illegal cargo, including illegal booze, stolen timber, poached venison, Excuse me. Really thirsty. Um, and uh, he would take it down to Chicago and sell it. He, he operated in Lake Michigan. He worked. He w he lived in Escanaba, and he operated out of there. And he and and he hit all the ports, you know, throughout the Lake Michigan. And he took the illegal cargo down to Mexico and sold it. He was even said to have kidnapped pioneer women and taken them down there and sold them into um, sex slavery. The, now, I mentioned that he wasn't, didn't have the accoutrement of a pirate, all the you know, trappings of a pirate. But he did at one point put a cannon on his deck because one guy was horning in on his illegal, illegally shot venison trade, and he says... This is my business, you know, stay out of there, it's my territory. The guy did not heed his warning, so he took, put, bolted the cannon on the deck and went up close enough to him, you know, shot a ball into the man's ship and drowned the entire crew. On another occasion, he went into Grand Haven and saw that there was a ship there with some very valuable cedar uh, lumber. And he figured, boy, in Chicago, I could get a lot of money for that. So he took, got a great big jug of booze, and, uh, and he took it over there, and was, they were telling sailor stories, you know, just bonding a bunch of sailors. He was pretending to drink, and the rest of them got schnockered. Once they were pretty much falling down drunk, he unmoored the ship, sailed out in the middle of Lake Michigan and tossed them all over. 
and sailed on to Chicago, sold the ship and the cargo. He, there was a chase down in Southern Lake, Michigan at one point. The feds were after him, port to port, and, and he was just staying one, one uh, leg ahead of them. They finally caught up with him, but he was never charged with anything. He never served any time. And after he pretty much retired from his life of crime, he worked for the feds to help them find other pirates, <laughs> other Great Lakes pirates. Takes a thief to catch a thief. Goes for pirates, too. Now, this picture here is of a doctor treating a man. This is on Mackinac Island. And you may have seen, there's like a, what do you call it, a diorama or something of this, of this in Fort Mackinac on the island. What's that? William Beaumont. Which is yeah, obviously a big name here because of the um, the the hospital uh, system based in Royal Oak, and he was a very smart guy, William Beaumont. Now I'm getting a little away from crimes. I, ha I guess I should have uh, mentioned a little bit here. This is there's no crime committed here, but it's part of the dark side of the mitten. In my new book, I talk about things that not necessarily crimes, but still some dark history. Well, the thing is that. A lot of good came from this because Dr. Beaumont was looking at a man named Alexis St. Martin, who was from Quebec, and he was trapping and trading on, well, trapping and then trading on Mackin Island, along with many people in those days. Uh, fur trapping was a very big business. And um, when he, uh, he took a, a shot in his chest, his, the left side of his chest, and there created it was an accidental shooting at the trading post. The wound healed in an odd way. There's a name for it, and I have it in the book, and I can't think of it right offhand. But it's where it, what it is is that it actually is the the wound doesn't doesn't heal together, but rather the inside and the outside heal so that there's a permanent hole there. So, another picture of um, William Beaumont here. You, he, would take, he, he would take food on a string and lower it into the hole, into Alexis St. Martin's stomach, and then pull it out and notice he discovered a lot about the acids in our stomach, and a lot about digestion. Well, it wasn't just a one-off experiment. So in the book, I kind of tell the story from the standpoint of Alexis St. Martin, because while this whole thing created some very good knowledge about our, our gastrointestinal system, it also, um, he kind of took advantage of Mr. St. Martin, who was illiterate, he wrote up a contract to allow him to continue to do tests on him, and which were getting increasingly uncomfortable at, for, for Mr. St. Martin. And um, so for about a decade, he not only was submitting to being his guinea pig, he was also, per the contract, was also doing chores for him. So it's pretty good, a pretty good deal for William Beaumont. Well, William Beaumont kind of, you know, made his mark in the medical world and, and, and made a lot of advances. But Mr. St. Martin, on the other hand, once he finally broke free from Beaumont, he said, uh, from Dr. Beaumont, uh, Dr. Beaumont moved to St. Louis and said, will you please come join me? I'd like to, you know, show you to some of my colleagues. I'd like to do some more experiments. And he said, no, I am done with this. Beaumont died, and other doctors and researchers started contacting him, and just, you know, constantly, just wanting to get, check out that hole. <laughs> you know, find out what they could, you know, maybe, maybe uh, do some experiments themselves. 
So when he went back to Quebec and he died, his family left his body out in the field in the middle of August for several days to rot under the sun and to be eaten by crows so that nobody, even in his death, could do any more experiments on St. Martin. If you're ever up in Charlevoix, man, this is more of a Chicago story, but I include it because it's Charlevoix. In Charlevoix, there's this beautiful home, just humongous, and it is called Castle Farms now. I'm not sure who owns it. It was a concert venue during the 80s and 90s. I saw Aerosmith there. Um, and it's named after, well, I'm sorry, it is not named after anybody, but the name Loeb is around town. There's a Loeb Road. There's a Loeb uh, uh, Wildlife uh, Sanctuary or something like that. And anyway, because this is young Mr. L Richard Loeb, and that is his friend Leopold, Leopold and Loeb. They became a very infamous murder team back in 1924 as, uh, well, Loeb, they both grew up very wealthy, and Loeb was a very good student. He was the youngest person at the time to ever be admitted into University of Michigan when he was a teenager. He worked on research for the Kirtland Warbler, which is a bird that's very unique to Michigan, and, and uh, so he was a very intelligent guy, but when he met Leopold at the University of Chicago, he, um, the two of them started talking about Nietzsche and the Superman philosophy, and they figured, well, they were supermen. They were above the rest of us because of their intellect and, and uh, you know, uh, their station in life. And they figured because of that, they could commit the perfect crime. They started out with robberies and, I mean, little, bur you know, stealing things here and there. But then they realized they had to, they had to kind of ramp it up to murder to really impress themselves. So they set their sights on a 15-year-old boy who was a distant cousin of Leopold's. They kidnapped him one day when he was walking home from school, beat him to death, set him out, kind of, you know, uh, disfigured his body, uh, left him in a culvert in northern Indiana. And um, the cops were, in you know, made it, made it pretty high priority. It was, it was a very uh, well-publicized case. When they um, were interviewing people, they also got around to interviewing Leopold and Loeb, and Leopold was so cocky, he said things like, well, you know, if I was going to murder somebody, it would be a cocky little creep like this guy. Well, um, they finally, what finally got them busted was that Loeb had lost a, lost a pair of glasses there, they took them, and they were kind of a specialized pair of glasses. They took them to some optometrists in Chicago, and one of them looked up his records and found that he had sold that pair to young Mr. Leopold. Now, I should mention also that Loeb's fortune, and he spent all of his summers in, in Charlevoix, his fortune was because his father was a big shot in Sears and Roebuck, which, of course, was the Amazon of the day, so he was... Uh, doing quite well. But anyway, he died in prison. He was murdered in prison. Leopold uh, was uh, released and then died in like 1967. Uh, now, Michigan's, when you talk about some of the big names of the outlaws in U.S. history, Michigan doesn't really, isn't home to any of them. No, Jesse James or no, you know, Nobody like that, but pretty, pretty boy Floyd got a, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry, babyface Nelson. Because of their nicknames, I sometimes have to think which is which. But anyway, babyface Nelson, who hated being called babyface, you did not want to call him that to his face, he 
kind of um, got his start robbing of, of leading robbing, uh, bank robbers uh, robberies in Grand Haven. Now, he had had a pretty good big rap sheet up to that point, but he figured this was the 1930s, the middle of the Depression, and bank robberies were all the rage. And if you could get, you know, a few guys together, you could do it right. And so he thought, well, I'm going to lead one. And he got his feet wet doing it in Grand Haven. One August day, they, he put it together. And uh, the thing was, though, that he put the person with the least experience in what may be the most important position. Anybody guess what that might be? Anyway, driver, you got it. So this greenhorn was sitting there behind the wheel of their getaway Buick outside of this bank when alarms went off around town that the bank was being robbed. Uh, they had him not only in the police department, but in one, one of the, in some of the stores and stuff. So an owner of a furniture store came out there and saw this guy sitting out in the Buick. And he says, what are you doing? And he's got his gun with him. And the driver got spooked and he took off. So when these 1930s gangsters in their suits and their bags of money and their machine guns came running out of the bank, they looked around no Freddy, no Buick. What's going on here? So they committed a carjacking, which was not even a word at the time, but they went, uh, uh, two young women and their children were stopped at a traffic light. They came up, pointed their guns at them, said, get out of the car. And nobody was hurt. They got in the car uh, and they took off in their car. Went a few miles, looked at the gas gauge. It's on empty, like seriously empty. So we can't exactly go to a gas station, you know, we're dressed like mobsters, you know, and there's words gotten around pretty fast that there's been a bank robbery. Uh, so they saw a Grand Rapids family stop at a strawberry stand and they saw that they had a, you know, their car was sitting there. So they parked behind them, ran, got their money and their guns and shifted them all to the family's car and took off. Got a few more miles and they got a flat tire. <laughs> now they really had to get to the Indiana state line. See, that's where they started because back then, this was, this was the 1930s and bank robberies, like, you know, we all know that they were all the rage and it was still a state crime. So if they could get across the state line, then the Michigan cops would have to stop and not pursue them any further. Because of the rash of, uh, of, Bank robberies, however, it would be made a federal crime shortly thereafter, but it had not been had not been uh, made that yet. Anyway, they did get away with it by when they they finally found a group of college students, jacked their car, and got to the Indiana state line. So nobody would have put their money on the college students having the most dependable car, but that's the way it turned out. Now. I mentioned also some of the big names. Now, so that was, you know, one of, that was Babyface Nelson's uh, Michigan uh, thing, uh, Michigan claim, <laughs> I guess. But of course, the biggest bank robbery of, uh, robber of the time was John Dillinger. He was public enemy number one. Babyface became that for a few months until he was killed after Dillinger was killed. Anyway. The story I'm going to tell, though, that has a Michigan element is, that's not often told, is uh, part of John Dillinger's most famous jail escape. That was in Crown Point, Indiana, in the northern part of the state, and where he whittled a gun shape out of a block of wood or a bar of soap, depending on who's telling the story, and made it black with shoe polish and then held it on a guard said open a door and they let him out now some historians think that that might have been made up by the police because they were really embarrassed that all he did was show a lot of money and they opened the door well i don't know i'm just giving you both sides of that but when he did get out when the door was open he said who wants to help me nobody raised their hand except for this man, 
Herbert Youngblood, who had nothing to lose. For one thing, he was a black man in the 1930s in Indiana, which had the death penalty. He had killed a grocery owner up in Gary when he robbed a poker game. He was probably had very little to lose. So he joined him. He grabbed the only thing that was near him, a toilet plunger, and he, he wielded that around, and they made their way to where the guns were kept. They grabbed some guns. They made it out to the garage. One of the, they even asked a mechanic which one of these cars is the fastest, and they, they said, well, the sheriff loves her Ford with the V8 engine. It's really fast. You should take that one. So they took that one. They put chains on because it was middle of March, and it was wetter and all get out. And they made their way west and north up to Chicago. When they got there, John Dillinger gave Herbert Youngblood $100 and said, said I didn't mean to do that, but it doesn't matter, and said, um, and said, you know, bid farewell and said good luck, and they were both on their way. Youngblood hopped freight train cars into Michigan, first into Detroit, and then he went north to Port Huron. And he was staying on the south side, which was in an industrial area that was largely black, and so he figured I could fit in. But he didn't do what he had to fit in with normal society because he spent most of his time really drunk and even bragged to some people that he knew John Dillinger and even bragged to some other people that he had broken out of jail. None of that put the cops on him until he went into this this little uh, general store, or little grocery store that was black owned and it was being run that day by the son of the owner. Now, he went in there and he stole a pack of cigarettes and he was drunk and belligerent. And the owner's son said, well, sir, you got to pay for those. And he says, mm, eh, he ignored them and he opened them up and started smoking them. He says, OK, you can't just put them back. Now you have to pay for them. And and. You know, or get out of here, I'm going to call the cops. He called the cops. Three officers from the county came. They patted him down. They found a gun, took it away from him, but he had another one hidden that they didn't catch, and he pulled that on him. And they, and all of a sudden, there was a gunfight. He shot all, all three of the officers in the chest in, in the melee there. One of them died. The, the two, other two survived. But the hero of the day was the son of the owner who grabbed, who dived when somebody dropped a gun, grabbed it, and shot Youngblood several times. Now, I sometimes read a little portion of my book, My Bad, but I left them back there in the back of the book. I See, I, I'm not doing as many of these as I was before COVID, and so I'm the routines are somewhat escaping me there. But I just will say that he asked for a Catholic priest. The priest was telling them him that, you know, if you confess, I can, you know, ask for absolution for your sins. He said, okay, tell us where Dillinger is. He says, okay, he's gone north into Canada, which was baloney. So I don't think there was going to be any absolution there. But he, um, he, he, anyway, he, he never ended up telling them anything true about Dillinger, and so he did not have to die a rat. Now, this man, his claim to fame, you, he's not famous by any means, infamous by any means. His name is Holsey, Raymond Holsey. He was a German immigrant in northern Wisconsin and the western UP, and he was hiding out on the trails back in the 1890s, and he was holding up people. And he was, you know, just kind of helter-skelter about it. He saw somebody, he'd pull a gun on him and say, give me what you got. One time he got a dollar. You know, he, he uh, you know, if it was a train or a stagecoach or whatever, or somebody walking along, he, and he cultivated the nickname the Midwestern Black Bart. Well, now, Black Bart was a very successful robber out in California who was robbing, like, Wells Fargo wagons. He was putting his homework into it so that he knew who to rob, who had the money, <laughs> and how to do it. So he was getting, you know, he was getting, he was doing all right at it. Not that, you know, 
I'm advocating that, but he, um, but there is a historical marker up at the south end of Lake Gogebic up in the western UP that says that this is the site of the very last stagecoach robbery east of the Mississippi. Now, I don't know how you know that, but that's the, the legend, is that he was the last stagecoach robber east of the Mississippi. But his story is so much more interesting than that because he held up a stagecoach that was occupied by three wealthy businessmen from Chicago, Minneapolis, and Montreal. <clears throat> and they had spent their summer on Lake Gogibic hunting, fishing, and living the good life. They were getting in the stagecoach to go back and catch their train home, their trains home. And Halsey comes out of the woods and said, you know, points his gun at him and asks for his, the demands that they give him their money. One of the men had a little pistol in his pocket and he stood up and pulled it and Halsey fired at him, hit him in the hip. The man fell on the ground. Now Halsey was a lot of things, but he wasn't a killer. He didn't want to be a killer. He just wanted to, you know, rob a few people, get some money. Um, the man was hit in the hip, fell on the ground. Halsey got, ran into the woods with like $40 and a gold watch and, and, and then just ran, got lost in the deep woods. And th that's a really rough area, a really wild area of the UP. Uh, and he walked for days. Well, in the meantime, his victim, who was shot in the hip, was put in a wagon for a 30-mile rocky, bumpy ride up to the nearest hospital up in Bessemer. And on the way, he bled out and died. So now, Holsey was a murderer. He came out of the woods in the mining town of Republic, and somebody looked at him and thought, now they'd been getting the telegraph, Morse code, you know, messages about this murder and, and the description of the guy. And they were saying, this, this guy fits the description. So they chased him. They let him, you know, stay there for the night and talked about it and planned it out. And in the morning, they chased him and caught him and turned him into the police. And when it hit the news that he was caught, the Midwest Black Bart, the thing that really got people riled up was that, um, well, I mean, not the only thing, but, but one of the things that got them riled up was that there were a hundred or so dime novels in the, when they searched the room that he had been staying at. So there was all these, uh, when you look at these, these, these old newspapers, like as far away from as, as St. Louis, they were thinking, is it dime novels that is making him? That is making, turning people to crime because they were filled with stories of, you know, what Western, you know, the, the beginning of the Western Wild West myth and, you know, stories of violence and stuff. Well, he went to prison. He cried at his, uh, you know, at his sentencing. He was sentenced to prison in Marquette. And while there, he said, well, he had said that the reason why I did this was because I fell off a horse onto my head and it, you know, because of my head injury, turned me to a life of crime. So he volunteered for a very, an ancient procedure that's very much in disrepute now, but it is called trepanning. Uh oh, somebody, I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> trepanning. And that's where they take a disc of your skull out, sew the flap of skin back over, and it's supposed to relieve some pressure on your brain. Well, he did, actually was a model prisoner after that. That's what they said, and the, the, the governor of Michigan ended up commuting his sentence and setting him free within a few years. He lived for 50 years more than uh, beyond that. He was a wildlife photographer in the UP, and he was a hunting and fishing guide until he went down to Florida in the 1950s. He was in his 80s or so, and he shot himself. Um, I'm not by any chance, not by any means, advocating trepanning. 
please don't go out and get a trepanning. If you're ever up in the Cine area, it's really interesting when you um, look at the, uh, this is Cine's historic Boot Hill Cemetery. It's for indigent lumberjacks back when Cine, because in the 1880s or so, Cine was like the boom town for, for lumber. And now it's just a tiny little town. And all over Michigan, there are towns like that. I mean, Saginaw was the big lumber town, and that remained a big town. There are ghost towns. Some towns just disappeared. Anyway, the, the graves are still there, and these are just some not very good pictures I took with my phone. But if you can see, the graves are sunken in because they just, you know, took them and dumped the bodies in there, no vault, no coffin or anything. So when they, you know, the bodies decomposed, the ground just caved in on them. Uh, during that time, when Michigan was uh, at its height of the lumber boom, it was also at the height of a prostitution boom in the lumber camp towns. Both in Michigan and Wisconsin, this was quite prevalent. And it became a cause celeb throughout the country. There were a lot of stories about it in the news papers about women who went to Michigan or Wisconsin tricked or, you know, whatever, or on their own, you know, both things happened, um, and turned to this life where, which was rampant with, you know, abuse, disease, suicide, all kinds of, you know, it was terrible life. There was a woman by the name of Minnie Pine who was one of the more famous stories that appeared in a lot of different newspapers who came from New York, upstate New York to Chicago to work in a restaurant. Then the restaurant owner took her up to the Western UP to, says, I know you can make more money, took her up to a brothel up there, guarded by dogs. She was, you know, beaten and forced to submit to this horrible life. And, um, so it became very well known, and people were, the, the, the governors of both states were wondering what they should do about it, particularly about the bad publicity that they were getting from it. And so, excuse me, the Michigan governor, Governor Cyrus Luce, and the guy who was the, uh, the governor of Wisconsin at the time, both did their own separate studies of the problem. The Michigan study pretty much came to the conclusion that, well, it's really not that much there. And what is there is kind of good for the other businesses in town. So. Then the, um, whoops, then the Wisconsin study came to the conclusion that, well, all these women um, want to be doing this. And they're pretty rough anyway, so, you know. It's like, you know, it was kind of poo-pooed the whole thing. It's, but the best study that was actually done was done by a woman by the name of Dr. Catherine Bushnell. And she interviewed like 200 different people and found that there was a lot of abuse. A lot of women were tricked into the life. And, you know, there's no denying that there were people who chose the life. But there were um, many who were coerced into it. Uh, and that it was rampant with suicide and drugs and, you know, all kinds of addictions and all kinds of uh, beatings and stuff. Well, when the Milwaukee newspaper wrote a response to her, it was, uh, they didn't, they did something that would have gotten me fired from <laughs> working at a newspaper. Instead of addressing the issue, and rightly so, the address, addressing the issues, he said, well, she looks like, you know, she's definitely not something to look at unless you had eaten a pickle and fallen asleep on a rail pile or something really ridiculous like that. The, 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 the quote is in my book, Dark Side of the Men. And, but I mean, you know, totally irrelevantly, uh, going after her for her looks, didn't even address it. So that was kind of the, I guess that was a sick burn back in the 1800s, but it's kind of the, the way it was, you know, it was... Nobody was really going to do anything. It did, it did kind of play itself out uh, and when, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that prostitution ended, but uh, when the lumber camps left, there was no, not, 
so much of it in the north. Um, I'm running a little bit tight on time, I think. I, uh, am I doing all right? I just have a couple more here. I do want to tell you about this guy. This guy is fascinating. And I don't say that just because his last name is Carr. His name is James Carr. And he was a horrible guy, and I don't think he's related to me, although we both, both do have roots from upstate New York back in the 1800s, but my family was here before he got here. Anyway, he, uh, he came in like 18, the late 1870s, and he worked in a lumber camp for a year or two and said, well, this is terrible because, you know, backbreaking work, you know, um, and you get paid once at the end of the season. Of course, you work all winter and then get paid in the spring, and quite often guys go out and get drunk and get, you know, rolled by people like James Carr for their wad of cash that they have, and so that they worked for, the, they worked the entire season for one good drunk. Well, anyway, he looked around and he said, instead of this life as a lumberjack or a shanty boy, as they were called, I'd rather... There's a lot of brothels around here. In fact, there were like 20 of them in Clare County alone. So he moved to Harrison in Clare County and opened up a brothel. He wired back to Rochester to his friend, Rochester, New York, not here. <laughs> and uh, his friend Maggie Duncan then said, will you join me in my enterprise? She did. They opened the most successful within, you know, just a few years, they became the most successful brothel of 21 brothels in Clare County. As a matter of fact, at one point, they were the biggest taxpayer in Clare County. And add to that the fact that they were also paying law, you know, the lawmen and the prosecutor and stuff under the table to keep, to, to look the other way, uh, at their shenanigans because it went beyond prostitution. I mean, he was accused of having somebody shot in a saloon. He was accused of burning down the, uh, the business and house of a competitor. He was accused. But there was also one, the worst one was one uh, young woman that was working for him by the name of Frankie Osborne. She was from Saginaw. She had come up there and uh, was working for him. And one night, a customer asked her to dance. It's probably to a single piano or a fiddle, you know, back in the, these little establishments. She declined because she wasn't feeling well. Carr saw that, and he came over and beat her in front of everybody. Uh, he held a grudge, so a couple days later, he beat her again, and she took refuge in another woman's room and died in the middle of the night. They were... That was raised an outcry, but they were trying to find something on him, and they couldn't find anything on him uh, yet. And well, I, I should have said that there was a there was there was an election in 1884 in which he and his Devil's Ranch, which was what people called the brothel, was, were like a major campaign issue to get rid of this, you know, the the prostitution, particularly James Carr, out of this out of this community. So the ones who said they would crack down on it, they won because the, 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 the farmers were starting to move in. The lumber was beginning to be played out. So the farmers were starting to outnumber the lumber people and they were more, less likely to, 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 to be, you know, like this thing, this kind of stuff. And so they were throwing any charge they could at him for a while because they figured let's, you know, until we can get the big one, we'll get him for, on anything that we can and keep him in jail and keep him harassed. And, you know, it was just a, a, which was their, a good plan until they could get something good. And it just so happened that him being in jail was what finally did it because he spent the night one night with a man named Harold Jones and Harold, uh, he, they got to talking and they got to uh, drinking whiskey and Carr says, if you want to make $500, which was a lot of money, I would like you to dig up a body, burn it, and there's a particular deputy, I would like you to shoot him in the back. And the guy was drunk, he says, okay, I'll do it. $500 must have been dancing in his head. And he says, uh, so he did the first one. He dug up the body and he burned it. 
But his conscience started really bothering him. And one night when he and a businessman, a traveling businessman from Lowell, were staying at the same inn, he says, if that stove over there could talk, it would have a really sad story to tell. So he took this man around the grounds and showed him, this is where I dug up the body. These are the hoops from the barrel that I burned that the body was in. And uh, he says, now I'm supposed to shoot this deputy, but I really don't want to do that. Well, the next morning, the guy from Lowell looked for a deputy, found one and, and told him what uh, Jones had told him. And so they finally had a case against James Carr. They tried him. They tried Maggie for operating a house of, what did they call it? A body house. And they put them both away, but only for a couple of years. They were both, I don't, I, I'm not sure how they got out of prison, but they didn't they spend more than a couple of years there. They came back to the area thinking that they would resume business. But for one thing, they were both just racked with addictions. And the lumber had moved on. So there was no clientele for them there. They died on a cold March uh, day in an unheated shack while a wanderer came in and drank up their last booze and then went and told the, the uh, a doctor that there's a couple of dead people in here. You should see also the way that they, the, another thing though, I mean, even somebody that horrible, the stuff that they wrote <laughs> in the newspaper uh, was just, it, it's a stitch. They ended up with a, after they, they, they after they, uh, you know, um, talked about his death and, and about how, where he, speculating as to where his soul might end up and stuff, uh, they, uh, they had a little poem that was, rattle the stones over his bones for he's only a pauper whom nobody owns. Newspapers were, were very entertaining back then, but very different. Um, I'm going to end up with this guy. This is Albert Molitor up in Rogers City. Um, he was a German immigrant back in the 1870s who came up there during the lumber boom as well. And he decided, well, he, he was half owner of what became the Rogers and Molitor Lumber Company. Rogers, who the city is named after, barely spent any time up there at all. He operated mostly out of Detroit, out of a law office, but he was, you know, uh, had money invested in it and such. But M Molitor was up there pretty much acting like king. He, he, had, he got himself, you know, uh, he named himself the county government, you know, the, the leader of, uh, they, they, he, he had them, uh, he, he paid the workers in scrip, you know, the old useless, basically monopoly money that you could only use at the company store. And so he could jack up the prices on lard and flour and whatever they needed. And, you know, and then they ba barely made any money because of that. Um, and he also, levied taxes for roads that never got built and they never saw the money again. So a kind of a, a, a loose posse came up and, and came up to his, the place where he lived, um, to his home one morning and, and said they were going to hang him and they threatened him, but they, they were, he kind of called their bluff. And he stood out there for the entire day with a stalemate and was in the middle of August, hotter than heck, you know, sun beating out down on him. Uh, and by the end of the day, nobody had eaten. And there was, it was just the whole thing was a stalemate and kind of a mess. And Molitor had his dinner. The table come brought out to the road. His uh, dinner served to him there, and he ate it in front of them. And the guys with the grumbling stomachs, they just, you know, broken spirits, they, they just left. 
But the stuff didn't end there. And in fact, there was more to it, too, because he was he was also offending people by coming on to their wives, their daughters, their mothers, you know, pretty much just a, a, a real uh, kind of a creep. And uh, um, he saw one picture of an employee's of a young woman that he was very infatuated with the picture. He said, well, she's beautiful. He says, well, it's my sister. Says, well, if I pay to have her brought over from Germany, will you, you know, put her on a boat and have her bring her over here and she can work for me? So the guy did. The young woman came over. She was his personal servant. She very soon became pregnant with his child, and he said he would marry her. So he got a sleigh, and they took a very romantic 250-mile sleigh ride from Rogers City down to Detroit. They got to a corner, a gas-lit corner back in those days, you know, Detroit. Picture old Detroit, and he stopped the sleigh, kicked her off the sleigh, and took off back up north. She sued him successfully for $10,000, but he wasn't going to pay her, and he never did. Anyway, the offenses just kept mounting up until one time they says, well, no more of this, you know, nonsense of threatening and stuff. They, uh, a whole bunch of uh, several people from town showed up in front of his window, his business window at dusk and shot right into the window, killed him and an assistant of his. And uh, there were several gunshots, so they couldn't, you know, from every direction. When the sheriff was investigating it, it was kind of like the murder on the Orange Express. Everybody had a motive. And also nobody was going to rat on anybody because they were happy to be rid of Albert Molitor. Uh, it took him 11 years to find anybody, and one guy who was uh, feeling guilty about something else he'd done took the rap for it. And then they finally felt that well, our, our job has been done. We got somebody from Mr. Melator. So anyway, that was a little bit of frontier justice up in northern Michigan. Uh, and that's where I want to end. And I just want to say something, though, because somebody before, and I forgot to mention, somebody, when I, when I do speak in Oakland County quite often, people ask me to about the Oakland child killer. I don't do a lot of that because I do have a chapter of that in my first book, Blood on the Mitten, about the Oakland County child killer and the different people who are suspects and the fact that nobody's ever been found and the fact, you know, that one guy who was a major suspect who died in, in a car crash and stuff. And, and in my third book, I have a story about a child sex ring that was um, up on uh, North Fox Island in the middle of Lake Michigan in the 70s around that time. And some people thought maybe that was part of it. And so the two are kind of, you know, we still don't know if there's a connection there or not. But one of the victims, some people have speculated, may have been taken up there and then brought, and then the body brought back here and dumped in Oakland County. Anyway, I don't go into those a lot because they're, it's about children. It's, it's, I write about them and it's easier to write about them than talk about them because they're more recent and it's, so it's harder. The distance of time makes it a bit more, it's almost a little bit of an escape. When you talk about the current things, it's less so, although it's still fascinating and very important. But I just wanted to say that. And also once when I spoke in Troy, I'll just end on this, a woman said that her father had a blue gremlin, which at the time they thought that the killer had a blue gremlin. And so everybody in the county who had a blue gremlin was being talked to, was being uh, interrogated. Her dad was interrogated on a few occasions, and she says she thinks it might have killed him because it, you know, it just upset him so much. That, so, so these things, you know, it's just the ripple effect of, of, the, of these crimes. Uh, so anyway, I don't take them lightly, but I am fascinated by uh, many of them. And I will end it there and say that my books... I will open up for questions. Also, my books are on sale back there, and they're $17 each, or all three for $45. Um, and um, um, anyway, so I thank you all for coming, and this is longer than I usually speak, but I enjoyed talking to your great group, and uh, if you have any questions, please uh, 
please feel free to open up. Yes. You had a blue gremlin. Okay. Did they interrogate you? They, they interrogated my wife and my mother-in-law. Wow. And was it quite upsetting? I mean, I would imagine. No, I thought it was funny. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, well, some people took it. I the wrong. I did, my, my driveway was snowed in. The others out next door it was under construction, but the driveway was clear, so I parked there. I parked in a, you know, Right. Okay. Well, that's, but anyway, so, so see that, you know, the horrible thing, it, it affected you in a very personal way. But, yeah, I'm glad that you didn't take it to heart quite as much as. Oh, okay. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. On, well, I, I've. I've gotten so many, covered so many things, I can't always bring them all up, but I probably should maybe put them back in the mix. Yes, I do have chapters about Purple Gang, fascinated with them, and their whole, you know, their, 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 their rivalry with Capone and then working with him and just all kinds of, you know, how they uh, became the, the um, provider of, 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 of liquor during the prohibition for much of the country. But yeah, the Purple Gang, I do have, uh, I mention them in all three of my books in different chapters. And so I have, a, I have chapters completely devoted to them in, in, in a couple of, the, in two of the books. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's, I don't know if I should, there, there, I've, they were Jewish, yeah. In fact, I don't know if this is even, well, I shouldn't have. Well, some people have referred to them, I might as well say, as the kosher nostra, which is, I don't know if that's offensive. I, I'm sorry if it, you know, but anyway. In fact, there's a book of that, but with that name, but yeah. Um, they are fascinating, and I do have chapters on them, and, uh, you know, uh, it's always hard to figure out what I'm going to talk to at, at, in, a, in an event. Yes, sir. That I have too, uh, and 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 uh, that was yeah, that was um, very good. Uh, bring that up. That was uh, Stephen Gifford Simmons beat his wife to death back in the 1830s. And he owned in the what is now the city of Wayne. In fact, there's a historical marker where his place used to be when it was just a muddy trail, and he had an inn that people would stop at between coming from out east off the, off the Erie Canal and coming up to Michigan. And anyway, he uh, was a big drinker, and he, was, uh, he beat his wife to death. He was hanged in the middle of Detroit, and it was such... It, it bothered a lot of people, even though it was kind of a carnival atmosphere when they actually did it, when they put it on. But people decided that it wasn't quite so, you know, fun to see somebody hang, apparently, because that led to Michigan being the first English-speaking government, I think, it is what, um, to outlaw the death penalty. And it still is outlawed in Michigan, for better or for worse. I mean, whatever you, you know, not to, don't know what people think of that. But anyway, so it is, a, yeah, that was a very significant case. And thank you for bringing that up. Yes, yes. <laughs> I wish I did. I wish I did. All those, I think, my, my own personal update, I guess, feeling is that I don't, we're never going to know. Yeah, but I think that those those come up, those come and go. I mean, remember a few years ago out in Milford, they just they just dug up an entire field on rumors that he was. They dug up, yeah, and they dug up in in one of the suburbs. They dug up a driveway where they, he was supposed to be buried under. Yeah, yeah, but they've done a lot of those excavations and. You were talking about professionals that did not want him to be found, and I don't think there might not be much left of them. 
I mean, even, you know, to find. Um, but there's, there's some people think that he was put in the column of a freeway overpass that was being constructed in Detroit at that time. You know, but if they ever find him, it will be amazing. I, you know, it's fascinating, and I love, I, I love whenever they have those things and think, you know, maybe this leads to something. But I'm not real hopeful because, yes, I've, yeah, I read that. That's a fascinating book. Yeah, well, we. I'm sorry. And what was the point? The Oh, right, right, right. Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, yes. Very good question. Yeah, there, there is that they were involved. Now, they had reason to be because it was their booze that was being hijacked between Detroit and Chicago because um, with um, Capone's rival was hijacking these trucks and um, in western Michigan generally and stealing the booze that was supposed to be going from the Purples to Capone. So when they, when they um, devised the uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The Purple Gang was believed to be involved. In fact, they even act, they were seen in Chicago, but some people think they were probably just used as lookouts. So they were involved, but nobody knows who pulled the trigger. But there's also, in Dark Side of the Mitten, there's a story about a guy who, by the name of Fred Burke, and he, and he was hiding out in St. Joseph, Michigan, and ended up shooting a cop. Anyway, when they raided his home, they found one of the uh, guns that was used in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and they did, there was a, they took it to a professor at Northwestern University when they talked to Chicago cops because there was, the, the, the science of ballistics was very young, and he was a pioneer in it. So they took it to him, and he helped them figure out that, yes, this is the gun. That So Burke might have been one of the guys, but we still don't know for sure because he was never charged with that. He was charged of, he was convicted of killing the police officer. But he never, he never um, confessed or anything to the, yeah, nobody still knows about the St. Valentine's. That, and that one may remain unsolved forever, too, as, to, as far as who actually pulled the trigger. So, anybody else? Well, I thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Very good questions, and, and I very much enjoyed talking to you. I'll be in the back of the room uh, if you want to come and talk about more. <laughs>